everyone. Welcome to our focus program of the Aldo Leopold Audubon Society. Um, tonight we have a very special guest. I got to meet John Bates. We don't know exactly how many decades ago, but at the Wisconsin, maybe you were there, Sue, at the Wisconsin um, Yay. Association for Environmental Education of that Tree Haven Tom Hawk for the Winter Workshop. And uh, John then was one of our guest speakers as well. Since then, he's probably wrote, written many more books. I may have gotten Trailside Botany from you during that uh, during that time, but um, fun little book. He's um, John's <coughs> author of 10 books and a contributor to seven others, all of which focus on the natural history of the Northwoods. He's worked as a naturalist in Wisconsin's Northwoods for 32 years, leading field trips, giving remarkable diversity and beauty uh, on the beauty and nature of our place with, and our place within it. Um, he served on the board of trustees for the Wisconsin Nature Conservancy, River Alliance of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Humanities Council, and he currently serves on the board of the Northwoods Land, Land Trust. John has a master's of science in environmental sciences uh, from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And John and his wife, uh, Mary, who is a fiber artist. And I think I'm going, that's gonna be a whole nother thing because she's a weaver and I'm a weaver and I think we'll seek out some weaving opportunities. <laughs> and uh, his wife, Mary Burns, lived together at the Man um, in uh, Van Twishwater, or Mantwish River in Iron County, where they raised two daughters. Um, so we welcome tonight, John Bates. Thank you all for coming, I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, whenever I give a talk, I'm well aware of how much expertise there usually is in a crowd. There's even more expertise in this crowd than an ordinary crowd. So I welcome any, um, Corrections, frankly, any uh, better ideas, any better jokes, any better <laughs> or anything that you may have, jump right in. It would be really nice to to uh, share some of some of that uh, experience and knowledge that you all have that I know about this much, and and uh, and I'm forgetting most of that these days anyway. So please jump in. It would be great with any questions, concerns, uh, additional information. Can we turn off uh, the lights. Is that Something we can do. Better. 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 Too dark and people start snoring. <laughs> okay. I just love, love the phrase, a place is a space with a story. And you know, in, in working on a, on a lakes book, I was acutely aware of how many stories there were that I that I needed to try to find out about and then to try to tell. Um, and you know, the people have asked me why why did I want to even write a book on wild lakes? And it's because I live in Manitwish, the big city of Manitwish, population about twenty nine, uh, and I live close to Frog Lake, uh, just a half mile. Uh, south of me, my wife's grandparents owned property all around there, had a little farm back in what is now the uh, Frog Lake State Natural Area. Um, and so we're back there all the time on that lake and on a variety of lakes that are also around us and paddling the Manitowish River. And what, what I was really curious about was how many wild lakes are left in Wisconsin? Um, I'm sorry. There's a little bit of a, this sign I'm going to remove. Good. And that should go away. <laughs> That's going to go away. Okay. It should. It should. Famous last words. Yes. So, <clears throat> where I live, I'm blessed with a whole lot of wild lakes. Uh, I have Frog Lake there. I don't know if you can see this map well enough, but Sandy Beach Lake to the south uh, east of me and Mud Lake are both wild lakes. Sherman Lake down at the bottom of the screen is a wild lake. Plunkett Lake is a wild lake. Up above there is Brush Lake and Kelly Lake. There's another two lakes that are within another couple of miles from me. So I have, I have this amazing density of wilderness wild lakes that I'm blessed to be around all the time. But the question I had was, 
geez, how many are in the whole state? And I was unable to find any information on that, which led me into this project, looking for an adventure anyway, uh, of trying to figure out how many there were. So when we think of, of, of wild lakes, we think big, and we think usually of some, you know, a huge lake, like Lake Superior. We also think of Boundary Waters Canoe Area. I imagine how many of you have been to the Boundary Waters? I'll bet like over half the crowd easily. Yeah. And so, you know, the Boundary Waters has merely, you know, over a million acres of land, 1,200 miles of canoe routes, you know, 1,175 lakes. Of course, we have nothing remotely comparable to that, but what do we have? And what, what were some of the stories, are some of the stories of those lakes? And that's what I wanted to try to, to find. So why do it? Part of it was just the adventure of trying to find all these places uh, and getting lost rather commonly. Uh, unfortunately being found, but there were a lot of places that were really quite difficult to get to and to uh, figure out how to get to. It was also an effort to uh, uh, put myself in the way of grace. I love that old, uh, I don't know if it's a biblical saying or what it is, but to be in wild places, I think, is always to put yourself in a way of grace. And it's, it's an emotional, spiritual experience, I think, for all of us when we get finally into a place that is exactly the way it's supposed to be and has always fundamentally been. Things change over time, of course, but still with that essence of wildness and uh, trueness to its nature. I love this quote by Wallace Nichols, where he says, the best and biggest benefits of water are all emotional. We, live, we love being in, on, around, near it, try as we might, no amount of scientific data, MRIs, or EEG readings, or carefully designed research projects can really show us exactly what we feel at these moments. So being on a, a lake like Aurora Lake here in Vilas County, I'm about to put in on, um, it's emotional. And I, and I use the word carefully, but I think it's a spiritual experience as well. Just to uh, eliminate this controversy, it may not be one in your mind, but it is in a lot of other people's minds of, of whether or not Minnesota has more lakes than Wisconsin has. Um, I'm getting blocked out on my statistics up there, but Minnesota has over 11,000 lakes and Wisconsin claims to have over 15,000 lakes. So we, we think that we have more lakes, but we define a lake as best as I can tell by anything over two acres, 2.2 .2 acres I found, the statistic ones, which is not much bigger than a, a pond or a puddle even, whereas Minnesota defines its lakes as uh, greater than 10 acres. So if you apply the 10 acre definition, uh, to Wisconsin lakes, we now only have 5,898 lakes. And then if you apply a 25 acre cutoff, we're uh, better than doubled by Minnesota. So Minnesota wins hands down the lake controversy. Uh, and so be it. We still have a lot of beautiful lakes, but uh, only uh, less than 6,000 of our lakes are actually named. And that tells you how small most of our lakes actually are. Almost all of these are, are uh, um, well, there they are. 50, greater than 50% of Vilas and Oneida County uh, lakes are less than 10 acres. 88% of Oneida County lakes are less than 25 feet deep. They're typically small. They're typically very shallow. Uh, yeah, they're just glacial pothole lakes. Nevertheless, Vilas County has uh, 1,327 lakes. 93,000 acres, about 16% of Vilas County is lakes, another 18% is wetlands. So about every three steps you take in Vilas County, one's gonna squish. It's a, it's a globally important area for lakes. And, and living up there right on the edge of Vilas County, I'm in Iron County is where I am. Um, I try to impress that upon people who have development all along these lakes that this is a globally important place and we need to step up to the plate and take really good care of it. So I didn't want to try to find all those little tiny lakes. I would, you know, I would have been long dead before I could give this talk. There's too many of them. So I arbitrarily decided to have a criteria of 30 acres or more. Could have used 40, could have used 50. But I decided 30 acres would, would make for a decent sized paddle or at least a reasonable size lake to sit on the shoreland of. Had, the shoreland had to be entirely publicly owned, had to be natural with no dams, no impoundments of, of, well, they could have a beaver dam on it, but no, no unnatural dams and no private homes visible. But they could have campgrounds and they could allow motors. And a number of lakes that I have in the book and I found that were 
met those first three criteria, four criteria, uh, still did allow motor boats, interestingly enough, and a number of electric motors. I put this picture down here at the bottom of one lake that I did not include in the book called Plumber Lake over in uh, Chippewa County, which is a wild lake completely uh, surrounded by public uh, ownership. However, the fellow who lives just above on that hill up there clear cut all the way down to where the public land was. And that picture doesn't show up, but he had a very large house. And so I didn't include it because uh, there, were, there was a private home visible. So arbitrary kind of criteria on my part, but that's what I used to try to say here. Here's ultimately the final uh, wild lakes in our state. Some are easy to find. Um, the lake on the left is Laura Lake in, in Forest County at a campground. That's our little camper that we took there. Uh, Sweeney Lake is on the, the right. Sweeney Lake has a big parking lot, asphalt parking lot, big asphalt boat landing, lots of big boats, people fishing there like crazy, but it's a wild shoreland. It has loons and ospreys nesting there. Um, it's a beautiful lake. <coughs> so some are very easy to find. Some were uh, significantly more difficult. Here's Grandma Lake in Florence County. Uh, and that's the put-in right there on the left, um, which basically is a bog, of course. And you had to walk across about 50 yards bog to, to get to the lake. And then on the right is Riley Lake, uh, also right <coughs> next to the Whisker Lake Wilderness area in Florence County. And uh, the beaver, there were three beaver dams along the Portage Trail into it all of which had flooded out the trail. And here's my wife ahead of me trying to work her way across these uh, flooded beaver dam trails. Uh, so they were really difficult. Some were really quite difficult to get to. And others we simply didn't even try, to be honest. So here's Ponds Lake in Price County, completely surrounded by pretty much open bog. And I just wasn't willing to suffer. I'm sorry, I'm 70 years old. I'm just not, I'm not gonna do that anymore. If I was five and stupid like I was back then, I would happily have probably have tried it. But both my wife and I looked at that and said, looked at one another and said, no. We just shook our heads and said, no, and drew, drew away. And same thing with Gates Lake there on the right. Uh, that's also in Price County. We drove to that spot that you can see on the map on the left where there was that little dotted road coming in. And uh, it was all grown up into a, a dog hair Apple stand, that road going in there, and there's there no way to bushwhack that road and carry a boat in. It also happened to be May 20th, and we just had, had the biggest mosquito hatch of that particular spring, and it was just frightening. You know, you've all been out in those kind of hatches, and they're just unbelievably intense, not to mention then we would have to bushwhack about a half mile through all this aspen. There was just no way to do it comfortably, so we, I included both of these uh, lakes in the book, but I simply said, Here's where they are. Here's what little I know about them. Good luck. Have fun. Write, write me. Email me. You get there. I'd like to know what they are, what they look like. So it's a five-year uh, project. Ultimately, uh, we found 136 undeveloped lakes that met that criteria of 30 acres or more. <clears throat> I divided those into what I called the 55 best, which is phenomenally subjective on my part, and the 64 best of the rest. And I kept 10 secret, mainly because I got a number of people who were on my case saying I should never tell anybody where these are, <laughs> including my wife, who kept uh, advocating all the time for you can't include that lake, you can't tell people about that lake. So I kept 10 secret. Anyhow. And I found them via plat books and, and uh, you know, Google Maps and Topo Maps. And, and uh, the DNR has a fabulous website for, to find every single lake in the state and, and it's quite a bit of information. Uh, on those individual lakes. So my job was a whole lot easier by having all this existing information. So, you know, why, why paddle these lakes? Well, you can't read where it says you are screen sharing, but it's, it says here's what wild lakes don't have. And, and we went to all these wild lakes and regular, almost all the time we were the only ones there. I can't imagine this particular lake is in China. Um, <laughs> I just can't fathom it. I led a hike just as an aside three weeks ago now for some students from Tacoma, Washington that come over to the Northwoods for some crazy reason. But anyway, they were there for a week. And one of them was a ninth grader from China. And he'd only been in the U.S. for a month. And I took him into an old growth stand, this group of kids. And he was moved, emotionally moved, uh, where he was 
he was almost unable to speak. He said, I've never been anywhere in my life where there wasn't sound. I live in a big city, 24 hours a day. It's traffic. It's people everywhere. Um, I've never been in silence. I had, I had no idea what this was about. And he was, it was just very powerful for me as someone who gets to be in quiet places regularly to see someone who had never been in one before and what their emotional response was. Wild lakes also don't have these lovely things. Um, you know, wakeboards are very controversial up our way these days and jet skis and big mansions and, and uh, big marinas. And they tended to not have these. Most of those that I was on, at least in my very brief uh, paddles on these lakes, uh, did not have any invasive species, which was, but I, I wasn't doing a survey for that. I wasn't uh, surveying the, submergent species. So they could have had curly leaf pond week you know, and so forth. I, I really wasn't looking at that. I was mostly listening to birds and looking at uh, shoreland flowers. So why else? So why paddle? What do they have? Well, they're just wild places to begin with. And all of them had stories and a lot of them had loon nests. Boy, unfortunately, we can't see all this quote, but uh, what uh, a fellow named Jack Turner, anybody ever read his book, The Abstract Wild? I've never had anybody in a group ever hear of Jack Turner and The Abstract Wild. A nice thin book that I think is brilliantly written. But he talks about how we treat places, um, uh, uh, flora and finance resources and playgrounds when we should be seeing their magic, their spirit, and the sacred aspect of them. And it reminded me when I was a boy, we would go to a lake. I was raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as a city kid. And we would go to a lake in northern Indiana because Wisconsin was too far to come. Indiana was far enough back then. And, uh, you know, I was a water skier and all that stuff. And I never cared an iota for birds and for aquatic plants. I saw a lake as a playground. I saw it as a flat surface to, to use uh, as basically a ball field. It just happened to be liquid. Um, I never saw it as a place that had spirit, had magic to it, had anything sacred to it. James Kunstler wrote a book in 1993, The Geography of Nowhere. Anybody ever read that one? Um, where he talks about how so much of America has become homogenized and have all these cookie cutter developments, and all these chain stores you drive into towns, you know, and they, they all look the same as you come into them. It reminds me of uh, Malvina Re Reynolds' song, Little Boxes. Some of you must know Little Boxes, that song back when, all ticky tack little boxes. So he claimed, Kunstler claimed that places have lost their souls. You know, I, and I felt that the value of these wild places is that they still have their souls. They still have a personality. They have a sense, a sensibility to them that says this is who we are and who we were meant to be. Kunstler talked about how we need to have a geography of somewhere because nobody wants to live nowhere. You know, we need to belong to somewhere remarkable and unique. And if you can paddle these kinds of places or simply visit, walk into them, I think you're in a, in a place that that has that definition now of somewhere versus nowhere. So how do wild lakes uh, <coughs> deviate or different from developed lakes? There's a 1997 study uh, done by the DNR up in our neck of the woods in Vilas County, comparing developed lakes again to undeveloped lakes. And the, the most obvious and simple way is to look at the vegetation along the shoreline and they showed quite a bit more canopy, but way more understory and way more shrub species on the wild lakes. And that alone tells you the difference that you're going to find, of course, within the lakes. And then to try to bring that down to species level, um, they also studied green frogs and they showed that uh, on a wild lake, there would be 40 green frogs per mile. And as development increased, when you got to 30 houses per mile, there were no longer any green frogs along the shoreline. Hey, can anybody here do an imitation of a green frog? I, I can't, I'm just curious. Is that loose banjo twine? I'd love to hear somebody do that. Um, anyway, so, you know, that developed lakes, maybe no one cares. You folks probably do, but the vast majority of the public doesn't even know what a green frog is and probably wouldn't care if it was gone. But it's an example of, of a loss on developed lakes. I thought this was a really fascinating study as well in 1997 as well. They did this constellation of studies simultaneously. And here's a developed, here are developed lakes showing the species that were so, uh, most common and most abundant on the developed lakes with the shorter bar being how common they were on undeveloped lakes. 
And what they found was that the number of birds were almost exactly the same. The abundance was the same. The difference was in the, in the uh, uh, diversity of species and the care, the, the species composition itself. So there's nothing wrong with any of these birds. Obviously, they're all good birds. Uh, I love great crested flycatchers or orioles or phoebes. Not so sure I love common grackles very much. Pine siskids, though, I do. Brown-headed cowbirds, not, but so forth. If you look, though, at what they found on the undeveloped lakes, a very different constellation of birds, black-throated blues and yellow-throated vireos, pine warblers, soits and thrushes, and so forth, birds that nest either in cavities typically or nest in the shrublands that have been so much removed along those shorelines or along uh, uh, or in the understory. So I thought that was fascinating and worth talking about, that people on a, on a developed lake are still going to see a whole lot of birds. And if you're not a birder, you're you're going to say, well, we've got plenty of birds. I, you know, we're not we're no worse off than, than anybody. Your wild lake isn't any more important than ours, and maybe it isn't, but it certainly is different in the composition. So, what are the values, other values of wild lakes? I'm talking to the choir here, but you all know these, and please add to these this list of only five I put in here. But they obviously support a fully functioning array of, of species, and. The diversity of species is only, is only part of it. There's a diversity of habitats that are undisturbed. There's a diversity of processes and interactions that are undisturbed as well. Whereas in developed lakes, a lot of those processes and interactions are altered via too much boat traffic or via uh, inputs of nutrients, et cetera. Wild lakes are also a storehouse of genetic diversity. You know, I always talk about the first law of ecology is to keep all the parts. So that these wild lakes are a parts inventory. Um, for the time coming, which I suspect will come, where we will need to try to restore some, some developed lakes or try to help some wild lakes that have been harmed uh, via development. And this would be a these wild lakes are places we might be able to gain or get some of those uh, species from and bring them to those uh, developed lakes. Maybe most important in my mind, or, or scientifically, the wild lakes are, are the benchmark the gold standard for how we should be managing. You know, if you're a manager, DNR manager, or a federal or county, whatever it may be, of a wild, of a developed lake, how do you know how to manage it? What, what's your model? What's your vision for what it should look like? Should, in large quotes. What's normal? I remember talking to Tim Crotts, who was the uh, director of the Trout Lake Technology Lab up in Boulder Junction, gosh, about 15 years ago, and I was asking him what all the research they were doing, they, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers coming out of it out of the Trout Lake uh, Station. And I said, what, what, what's the overarching question you're trying to determine? And he said, we're still trying to figure out what's normal. And I thought that was a fascinating statement. We're still trying to figure out what's normal. And they, I think, would still say that. And what I found out is there's no such thing as normal in all of these lakes. And going to one to the next, someone asked me what, what surprised me the most. And, and this wasn't a surprise, but it was a confirmation of what I thought we'd find, which was every lake was a surprise. Every single one, because they are very different and they can be very close together and still be quite different. So other values, education, recreation, beauty. Uh, a writer of mine that I, that I read frequently says beauty is not optional. I really like that, beauty is not optional. I, whenever I speak to a crowd up in the Northwoods, I look at everybody and I say, so why did you all move here? Or why are you all visiting here? Or why are you, and did you come here to make money? I haven't had anybody yet raise their hand to say they came up North to make money. So did you come here for beauty? Everybody raises their hand. Now, they may also come here to hunt or fish or to kayak or any of the recreational opportunities that one may, may utilize when they're up north. But fundamentally, base uh, line of everything is people come for beauty. And these wild lakes are some of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Beauty is not optional. We need it in our lives. That's, yeah, we need beauty as well as bread. Quote from John Muir. <laughs> And finally, peace, uh, you know, it's a reservoir. These sites are a reservoir of what, uh, you know, carefully, cautiously using the word of what is sacred. I think, you know, when people come up north, many people, the first thing they do is they throw all their stuff in their house and they walk down, if they live on a lake, to the pier and they just sit there and, and start breathing. Do you know what I mean? And maybe some of you have that same experience where you just, just let out all that tension <laughs> coming from wherever you come from. Um, and these wild lakes provide that peace. Paul Grukow, unfortunately, is crossed out there at the top. There's no way we can get rid of that, is there? 
we've been discussing it, and I apologize. Uh, we're still. I still remember that when we do Zoom talks, that yes. whenever I've done them, they always get crossed out, and I always forget that that's the case. I need to move my yeah. Sorry about text that. down. So anyway, Paul Grukow is an author from Minnesota, no longer uh, with us these days, but wrote about the values of wilderness. And so he talked about the value of silence, that the wilderness sings because there's so much silence, there's no noise that doesn't belong to the place. And a lot of you are birders here. I know you know the song of Winter Wren. Oops. It's supposed to sing. Let's try this again. There it is. Can I turn up the volume in any way, or can everybody hear that okay? What I, you know, that song is about five to six seconds long. The bird sings on the in breath and on the out breath. Um, and it's an incredibly complicated song. So here it is slowed down to one six speed. <laughs> Before I hear that, it, it shivers up my spine, to be honest. It's just, I mean, I often wonder what a bird, you know, we hear at normal, what we think is normal speed, but what do birds hear? Do they hear, do they hear all that? Do they hear that slow down some? Why combine so many notes into such a complex song? There's probably some ace birders in here. Any ornithologist can answer that question? Why would you compress so many notes in? Anyway, I find it fascinating. Another value, value of uh, wild places is solitude. You know, and solitude is different than loneliness. Uh, loneliness isn't a choice. It's a negative state, not something anybody wants, but solitude is something we choose. And it's a place where your own company is very sufficient indeed. That's my beautiful wife in one of the lakes. Another value is, is self-reliance. You know, there's no one else to blame for anything, which is great. It's all on you. It, you know, you you have to be enough. Any mistakes are your own. And you have to pay attention. I think the, the highest points in our lives when we're fully present, 100% right here, right now, intensely engaged because we don't have a choice. You know, and that's what happens in wild places as a general rule. You have to pay attention. And I like the fact that Grukow says that in the wild, ego is as useless as money. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the biggest, baddest person in the planet. You're no different than anybody else out there. You better have a whole set of skills or you're going to have a whole lot of trouble. Humility is another value of wilderness. It teaches us that there's forces a lot larger than ourselves. Nothing's arisen by our own agency, of course. And, you know, I, I always quickly realize how little I know. Um, and that's classic. We all know that. The more you know, the less you know. The world just opens up wider and wider. And I love this, this uh, quote from Terry Tempest Williams. Equality is expressed through humility. Think about that for a second. Equality is expressed through humility. If you're a humble person, if you don't see yourself as the most important species on the planet or individual, as the case may be, you will find yourselves on equal status, maybe as the pickerel weed and maybe as the winter wren or as the loon or whatever other species around. The value of meditation, of, of thoughtfulness, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> there's no tweets, thank God. No radio, TV, phone, all that. And uh, what happens, at least for me, and I think it's true of all of us, when we get into wild places, <clears throat> slowly and slowly we just start sloughing off all of the stresses and 
intensity of our lives and we start asking the right questions and start thinking about the right things that philosopher that's inside of us tends to come out and start questioning about who we are and what we're doing here with this one wild and wonderful life that uh, is only so long and all of us here with gray hair know the mass against us so you know what are we going to do with the rest of our time and finally uh, maybe the most important value of, of wild places is it helps us fall further in love with the world Leopold's many, many quotes, but this one I always remember is we only grieve for what we know when we only protect what we love. And so going to a wild place, hopefully in writing the book, the intent was to get people to these places and have them be so wild and so taken by them that they would want to learn more about them. The more you learn about a place, the more you fall in love with them, in my opinion. And you give things the dignity of their names. You learn not only their names, but their who-ness, their personality. And you do it bird by bird and flower by flower. And, and it takes an entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. And at the end of your life, you still don't know diddly squat, but you have a lot more fun knowing what you do know. It's an education of the heart as well as an ecological literacy project uh, going into wild places. So unfortunately, that quote is broken off. So I can't read you the top line and I don't have it memorized. But E.A. Burge was talking about this, the inland, small inland lakes being a uh, model with all the intricacies, the best model in one small place of all of the ecological intricacies one would want to find uh, pretty much in the whole world. So why do they, why do wild lakes different natural areas? One of the things I wanted to figure out as a naturalist, not figure out, but just try to explore, because I never did figure out much of anything, even though they're right next to each other. And so in the, in the book, I listed 10 things. I wasn't trying to write a limnology textbook. I'm not competent enough to do that, knowledgeable enough to do that. So I was trying to write for the average person putting it on a lake, say in the boundary waters, and you're paddling from this lake to the next lake, and this one lake is crystal clear. And I remember in the boundary waters, once paddling from one lake that was had to have, have 20 plus foot water clarity, and we get in quarters into the next lake, and it was like two or three foot clarity. That was it. Full of algae. I was like, well, what's why? And so anyway, I talk about 10 things in the front of the book that any average paddler can just think about without having to be a, you know, a PhD limnologist. And I talked about position in the landscape, elevation, all those things. We're going to go through just a few of those. And talk about elevation first. That was one of the things that the Trout Lake uh, folks were trying to figure out in terms of what's normal. Uh, they, they emphasize always looking at the elevation, where, where a lake occurs in a landscape. And the higher up in the landscape, the smaller the lakes tend to be, the clearer, the fewer nutrients. You know, they're being... A lot of these lakes at the tip of the land, landscape are, are receiving all of their water or nearly all of their water from precipitation. And as you go down the sandbox and think of the Northwoods as a giant sandbox, which fundamentally it is, you're going down all that groundwater from lake to lake to lake as you go continue down into the lower in the landscape, you're getting just more and more nutrient flow. And so if you want to go fishing, you go fishing low in the landscape. If you want to go swimming, you go high in the landscape. You're going to have a lot clearer water up at the top than you're going to have down at the bottom but you're going to get a lot more fish down the bottom. Lakes also vary according to the amount of groundwater coming in via elevation again, but also the shape of lakes. So I, here's a classic example for me up in Vilas County, Crystal Lake. I think we've got a little pointer here, but Crystal Lake being this little round lake down here, 50 yards away from Big Muskie Lake are very different. Crystal Lake is 1,647 feet in elevation and Big Muskie is 1,641. So six foot difference, Crystal Lake flows into Big Muskie. It takes three years for the water, groundwater to flow 50 yards from Crystal Lake to Big Muskie, which is really astonishing. <clears throat> and just some statistics on the difference between Crystal and Big Muskie. And you go down to the bottom, which is covered up with my, my voice. <laughs> But basically, it's double, double the amount of groundwater flow going into Big Muskie compared to what's going into Crystal. You have double the amount of nitrogen, double, well, triple the amount of, of total uh, phosphorus, et cetera, all up and down the line. It's different simply by dint of the fact that Crystal Lake is six foot higher in the, in the landscape. Now, it's more complicated than that, but it's a major factor. Another major factor is the shape of the lake. Crystal Lake is this perfectly round lake. But if you look at Renard Lake, which is over in Bayfield County at 33 acres, it's shaped like this kind of uh, uh, built, uh, built broad bodybuilding uh, bar. And so you have a lot more inputs all along that 
uh, convoluted shoreline than you do around uh, a rounded shoreline. So a lot more plant and, and uh, nutrients coming in and the uh, by dint of the shape of the lake. Makes a difference. Oops. It's just that. We'll go back. Watershed size makes a difference. Here's a lake in Devias County as well. Moon Lake has a watershed that's only 345 acres. That's really small. And, you know, it's got a, a, a secchi disc gradient of 16 feet, which is almost a legotrophic, somewhere in that ballpark close by. Um, it's developed to a certain extent, but it's really, really a very clear lake. But if you go next door to Little St. Germain Lake, Moon Lake, you can see there on the right, separated by oh, maybe 75 to 100 yards to get to the East Bay of uh, Little St. Germain. That East Bay of Little St. Germain has a secchi disc reading of 1.5 feet compared to 16 feet in Moon Lake, only 75 yards away. And it has so much to do with the shape of the lake, with the size of the watershed, 6,400 acres is that watershed for Little St. Germain. All that development all along the shoreline, all the nutrients people are pouring in, uh, from all different sources that, that we do as human beings. And then there's just that long, narrow shape of the lake induces a whole lot more uh, plant life, both along the shorelines and, and leaf, leaf fall in, in the autumn, et cetera. So just tremendous difference based on watershed as well. And then the food web, I thought this was a fascinating study that, that the DNR did down on uh, Lake Mendota. They realized that Lake Mendota is you know, pretty much uh, Indian green most of the time. And they thought, well, how do we clear up the water? And they said, well, what we'll do is we'll introduce predator fish. And they put in uh, over 12 years, they put in over 2 million walleye and 170,000 northern pike. Anybody familiar with this experiment? Just out of curiosity. A biomanipulation experiment. And the whole idea is that predator fish eat prey fish, right? Prey fish eat zooplankters and zooplankters eat phytoplankton, algae, if you will. So if you have more predator fish, you're going to have fewer prey fish. If you have fewer prey fish, you're going to have way more zooplankters. If you have way more zooplankters, you have way fewer phytoplankton. It's the food web. The experiment worked. They actually uh, increased uh, the clarity of water by three feet by introducing so many predators. Ultimately, though, it was a failure for two reasons. One, all the fishermen in the whole area found out of all these predators being in the, in the water, all the walleye. And, and pike and fished them out pretty good, but also somehow spiny water flea got introduced and spiny water flea eat zooplankton. And they daphnia like crazy and reduced the zooplankton population. So the phytoplankton bloomed like crazy and ended up decreasing the water clarity by an additional three feet. <laughs> but no, it didn't have anything to do with the science of it uh, in terms of what the biomanipulation experiment was. But anyway, the more predator fish, interestingly enough, that you have in a lake, It'll alter the clarity of the lake. Does that make sense? Another thing that's really important in, in uh, uh, wild lakes is, is having coarse woody habitat all along the shoreline and within the water itself. Cleanliness is not next to godliness. If I be quiet long enough, you might be able to read it, read the uh, read the cartoon, the Gary Larson cartoon that says, clean it up, clean it up. Crime, it's supposed to be a rat hole. I like that very much. <laughs> we need random chaos, which is the other term for habitat, along uh, forest floors and within our shorelands and within our lakes. Dead and dying trees provide every bit as much ecological value as they do during their life, in my opinion, and in lots of other ecologists' opinions. So uh, one study in Canada found the average age of logs in a lake was 443 years. And some have been in the water for as long as a thousand years. Uh, John Magnuson out of the UW Madison Limnology Department calls that the long now. Um, so these trees and branches can stay in the water for a very long time. And when you remove them from the shoreline, as has happened in this highly developed lake, it takes 200 years to replace those trees again in a study um, done actually up in our area in Vilas County impacts the shore. Uh, residential development on course woody debris. So removing what, what most people do when they buy a home along a lake is they go right down to the shoreline and they pull out all the, the <laughs> all the sticks in the water and so forth. And, and then they blame the Indians or the DNR for having uh, ruined their fishery. Um, and it's, it's a shame. 
It's a shame. People just don't realize. People are more and more realizing the value of course woody habitat. Now we have fish sticks rather than fish cribs and people are encouraged to, to put along their shoreline. We're getting there, but we got a long ways to go. So anyway, I want to just give you a sampling of some of the wild lakes from north central Wisconsin, some of those 136 we found, and then I'll be done. I don't want to take too much of your time. So let's look at uh, Forest County, McKinley Lake. See that right in the middle, 48 acres, 20 foot maximum depth. Here's the put in, just a little scrape. There's a little campsite, campsite one, a single campsite up on a hill right above there. And what was fabulous about McKinley Lake was going back to Courseworthy Habitat, the number of logs that were on the water that had to have been there for I don't know how long, but for, for a very long time. And what I've never learned, and I know Bob Freckman's hiding in here somewhere as a botanist, maybe he can tell me, how long does it take for a log laying in the water to be colonized by moss, by sphagnum? Anybody know? Probably fairly fast. At least uh, yeah. some, at least some of the moss will come in there pretty fast. How, how fast is pretty fast? Uh, I don't know of anybody that really timed it. <laughs> <laughs> are we talking a decade? Or are we talking shorter than that? Or shorter than shorter that? that. Moss uh, will now, come. To get a real quality of diversity there, that's going to take a while. Any general estimates? Not going out too far on a limb. And how long it would take this? This log is colonized by tons of, of sundew plants, a variety actually of small shrubs. So any idea how long that would take? Well, it, it might begin to look like that in 20 years or so, but it's very possible, more likely that that's quite old. I mean, that 50 or 75 years would, would not be surprising. Yeah. Anyway, there's dozens of these logs all along the shoreline of, of McKinley Lake loaded with these sundews. Hopefully you're all familiar with sundews, a little insectivorous plant that captures hopefully mosquitoes and slowly uh, closes over them and digests them over a period of time. Uh, but just sundew heaven all along these, uh, these logs. Shoreland also had uh, rose begonia orchids on the far north end and steeple bush and marsh skullcap and a whole array of beautiful <clears throat> both uh, submerged uh, emergent uh, plants in the water and then shoreland plants as well. Just, just an amazing array. You know, uh, I'm an amateur botanist guy at, at best. Um, I'm a generalist. I don't, I know enough to write a book like Thrillside Botany, which is super general. Be laughed at by Bob probably because it's so general, <laughs> but my intent is always just to work with the general public and help them as kind of an entry into uh, the natural world and to try to fall in love with it, still protect it. But anyway, this, this shoreline was fabulous. What I also liked about McKinley Lake is you can see up here where McKinley Lake is. Bowes Lake has one house on it. Two Sisters Lake is wild. Uh, Butternut and Franklin have homes on it, but Luna and White Deer are wild lakes. Pat Shea down here is a wild lake. Uh, and there's a 12 mile long hiking trail called the Hidden Lakes Trail that walks all around that area. There's three or four state natural areas. So I rated highly in my 55 best. I not only rated a lake by how diverse and interesting it was as a lake itself, but also the amenities around it. Was it, was it a wild place that you could go visit other lakes and hike other places or go biking or other recreational things that you could do? Frog Lake and Pines, right where I live, um, is within a 1,290-acre state natural area. Aerial view of it there. And it's loaded with purple bladderwort. Um, there's two species of purple bladderwort, and I don't know which this one is offhand. I know Bob knows bladderworts. Does anybody else know bladderworts? I'm always curious if anyone in the audience is familiar with bladderworts. Good, I can say just about anything I want. Um, <laughs> They're just an amazing plant. The, the expert in the state is Susan Knight, who works up at the Trout Lake Limnology Lab. She uh, did her PhD on bladderworts. And she would put the, so that, what you're seeing on the right are the bladders. The, uh, this is a, a floating plant. It's not rooted. It just floats on the surface of the water. And the bladders hang down into the water. And they have a little trap door on them. And they open and close and, and says, Susan, 1 465th of a second. 
she would try to see, have it under her microscope and she would try to feed them Daphne and so forth. They, they eat zooplankters. Um, she could never see it happen. Just suddenly the zooplankton was inside of the bladder. They, they just moved too darn fast. And from what I've read, they're the fastest moving plant on earth. This is the Usain bolt of plants right here, bladderworts. We have five species maybe of bladderworts. I could be wrong. Something in that order uh, on our lakes, at least up north. Um, and this is just one of those species. But thousands of these purple bladderworts, usually about the 1st of July, on Frog Lake. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. And I also like to remind folks that lakes are not just beautiful in the summer, they're beautiful in the winter. This again is only a half mile from our house, so we're over there <clears throat> skiing along that shoreline. There's some beautiful pine along there or snowshoeing, either in the woods or right along the shoreline. These lakes, wild lakes are gorgeous in the winter as well. Frog Lake also has some really big pines, which to me makes it even more of an interesting lake because of, of the shoreline vegetation. That red pine on the left has a very large uh, fire scar on it. And you can, when I'm not talking, you can see that there's a little slot cut out of the bottom of a uh, DNR uh, fire ecologist, cut a tree cookie out of the base. And he found that this red pine began life in 1804. So it's now 218 years old. And what was most interesting to me is he found that there were fire scars every decade from the 1830s to 1900. So it was like 1835, 46, 57, something, you know, just every decade, which clearly said to me, although he's not willing to go out and live and say this, the Native Americans were burning just a half mile away from where I live, burning that understory every decade. And, and if we had an older tree than this, I'll bet we would have seen every decade that they're burning there. I was, I was just out with a Native American group yesterday in this site talking about this. And one of the Native American leaders there of that group, I asked, you know, do you, do you guys talk about the fact that you used to burn a lot? He says, oh yeah, we burned all the time. And then on the Flambeau Reservation, right next to the Lacta Flambeau Reservation, there's a road called Prairie Road, and they kept actually south of Black de Flambeau in Prairie up until the settlement period. And now it's grown up, but they had always, they'd always burned it. They always talked about burning. And Jed Munier is the guy who's doing this fire ecology. So he's finding tons of fire sites up north. And we think always of, you know, oak savannas as of course of being burned by Native Americans, but we don't think of Native Americans utilizing fire up north. And his study, anyway, is showing that. And certainly this site, to me, anyway, I'm willing to go out on a limb because I don't have to protect any particular reputation like Jed has to. I'm willing to say it has to have been Native American burning because you just don't have lightning strikes every 10 years, fundamentally, on such a consistent basis. Anyway, that makes Frog Lake even more interesting to me. Here's Moose Lake over in Florence County. Um, I wiped out the it's 200. It's one of the largest ones. I'm sorry, Moose Lake's in Iron County. Uh, 270 acres, one of the largest ones we have left. The top of the map shows homes there on the on the east shore. Those have all been removed. Um, it's only 12 foot maximum depth, six foot mean depth. So it's a really shallow, but very large lake. It's within the Moose Lake State National Area of 4,200 4, acres. Really wild country. If you want to get really lost, one of the best places to get lost in all of Wisconsin is central Iron County. Just, oops, I mean to do that. Um, <clears throat> just north of where I live. Uh, this is really wild country up there. Anyhow, so Moose Lake's right in that area. Just going to whiz through these guys. Kennard Lake down in Oneida County, 44 acres, 23 foot max. Connected up to Sweeney Lake via a little creek. Sweeney is a wild lake I mentioned earlier that has all the access via motorboats, but still a large wild lake. So it's kind of neat that they're right next to each other. And they're so very different. Kennard is crystal clear. Loads of these white water lily colonies. And Bob, please correct me again. I apologize for bothering you during this talk. You should never have come and identified yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been anonymous in here, but what I have read is that these wild uh, white water lily colonies can be a century or more old. The rhizomes in the sediments can. So when we talk about old growth, I wrote a book on old growth, but whenever I'm taking people out on old growth hikes, and we're next to a lake and we see water lilies, I say, hey, you know, old growth occurs within lakes as well. Is that an accurate statement? No. Okay. How do you, so how, and they always ask, well, how do you age 
that rhizome of the white water. Do you have any idea? Because I never can. I don't know. But there are there are a number of other understory things, usually on the land, where you can actually trace it. And uh, a lot of the records are the club mosses. Yes. Um, and and uh, easily they'll get a thousand years on some of them. Thousand. So I've always told people a hundred years or more, but a thousand. <laughs> How do you age in club moss? Well, one of the things, if you look at, uh, at the length of growth on the main stem, it's like a couple of inches a year. And if it's undisturbed, sometimes you can just stand on the edge of the colony and look how far back it goes. And it doesn't take a great imagination to figure out uh, how long it took for at that rate to create a colony that size. And then, of course, you can use DNA and things like that to make sure it's the same individual. Thousand years. That's great to know. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I love coming to a talk where I get to learn stuff too. That's marvelous. So I'll try not to pick on you anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mary, anyway, lots of white water lilies. If you've never leaned over to smell a white water lily, you need to do that without tipping your canoe over. Uh, Lots of them smell like fresh oranges to me. Some don't smell at all, but uh, occasionally you get those that just sort of have this lovely smell. Come on. I bought a camera to sh take shots underwater, but the problem is I'm just leaning over the boat holding the camera like that, and I can't focus it. So 99% of what I took underwater didn't work at all, but here's my best one. I thought this one. So I had to include one for all the shots I took of uh, looking up at the, from the bottom side, looking up at those the leaves of white water the leaves. Thought that was lovely. And got one other good shot on Canard Lake. Of, uh, I think that's a pumpkin seed. Uh, anyway, musky weed, large leaf pond weed uh, in the uh, understory, if you will, the sediments of Canard Lake, Rose Begonia, orchids growing on the North Shore, little bog area. That brings us to McNaughton Lake, also in Oneida County. A lot of these lakes that are still wild are really shallow, um, really silty. Those ones that you put your paddle in and the paddle just goes and goes and never stops. You know, if you fall in, you're not sure if you'll find your way out kind of thing. Um, this is one of those kind of lakes. It's a large lake, uh, 121 acres, but still very shallow. Here we are putting in, beautiful little lake, nice boat landing. Lots of water willow, swamp loose strife uh, along the uh, eastern shoreland, a species that we don't see very commonly up north anyway, occasionally, but not, it's not a common one that I see anyway. And what I found so interesting about the Mountain Lake, it was loaded with northern water snakes, which for some people horrifies them. But for me, I thought it was fascinating. Now, I don't want to pick one up particularly because uh, they're big. They're four foot long and can be, uh, you know, they'll bite you. And, and, uh, I'll bite you if you try to pick me up too. You know, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, this is a, a lake for whatever reason, and I have no idea why. It is loaded with northern water snakes. Tucker Lake, we were talking about this earlier uh, in Price County. Beautiful lake, 107 acres, 32 feet max, 14 foot uh, mean. But the only way to get there is to portage in either from on a trail coming out of the north or you can cross Round Lake, paddle across and there's a boat access carry in. That's not too far, maybe a quarter mile uh, into Tucker Lake. Um, just a great site. It's a great site because it's a state natural area uh, for the old growth properties that it has. Interesting to me that the state natural area did not include the eastern shoreline of Tucker Lake. I always wondered why we wouldn't have included an entire wild lake as part of a state natural area, but it was not included. It's also a research natural area. We have 693, I think now, state natural areas in the state, and we only have 19, if I have my number right, research natural areas in our state. The feds are a lot more cautious about naming such places. But anyway, I thought, you know, if you have a place that's both a federally recognized and state recognized site, that tells you it's pretty darn special. Uh, and this, it's special in large part because it's an old growth hemlock hardwood forest. It's got this trail that goes around it. If you can see that sign, 
that you can hike in uh, starting at Round Lake. And I've led many hikes to Tucker, Lakes over the, Tucker Lake over the years for the old growth uh, component. Here's my youngest daughter and our Australian shepherd walking the, the portage trail through, through the big hemlocks. Miles County had the most wild lakes, 24. I think Bayfield County was second with uh, 15. I think that's right. Iron County uh, was third, along with uh, two others that also had a dozen. Anyway, I'll just give you a few of the wildest ones. Uh, Bittersweet Lakes State Natural Area, right near Manaqua, just a little ways uh, east on Highway 70, is the only place in all of Wisconsin with decent sized lakes that are connected by portage trails. And I'd love somebody to counter me and say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but this is the only place. Does anybody know of, there's uh, two sites in uh, Sawyer, not Sawyer County, in Washburn County, um, they're in my book, and of course I'm spacing out what they are, but they're very tiny little pothole lakes that are connected. Sawmill lakes. Sawmill lakes and Lennard, Lanard, yeah, yeah. right near there as well. But they're little 10 to 20 acre lakes that didn't meet my criteria of 30 acres. These guys are all larger than 30 acres. It's the only site, which astonishes me. It can, does anyone know of any site where there's more than two lakes connected by portage trails? I didn't find them. It's astonishing to me. Nor did I find, by the way, any wild lake that was a square mile or larger. We don't have a square mile of wild lake left in this entire state. So anyway, here, just a couple quick slides. There are campsites on each of these four lakes and uh, beautiful little portage trails, very short little portage trails between them. So it's a lovely single day, easy uh, paddle to get into all four lakes, go slowly around the shoreland and come out you know, six hours later or so and have had just a lovely day at the Bittersweet uh, State Natural Area. Here's Aurora Lake. It's 83 to 94 acres deep, depending upon <laughs> the given year because it's only four foot maximum in depth. And most of the time it's not even four foot. So you're in this big wetland and it is a fabulous wild rice lake just loaded as part of the Aurora Lake State Natural Area. And I want to point out Frank Lake up to just above it. And I'll show you Frank Lake in a moment just to show you how different lakes can be right next to each other. So Aurora is four foot deep. It's usually wild rice end to end. This particular year, the rice was four. Uh, it got better this year, but it's still not back to snuff. Usually I've led numerous, not numerous, a few trips on Aurora Lake over the years. And when I get people, I usually take them in September. Um, when I get to the shoreland, people say, where's the lake? Because it's just rice the whole way. You think you're, you're, you're paddling basically in a tall grass prairie, since rice is a, is a grass. But you happen to be paddling and not walking. So here's a whole bunch of rice. And what a lot of folks don't know about rice is that the female flower is above. The female flower is that little tiny flower way up at the top. I did a close-up of it there. And the males are down below. Uh, whenever I'm on a hike with folks, I say, well, why, why would the males be below the females? Why, why that arrangement? So that's your quiz. And I'm almost done, I promise. In two minutes, I'll be done. But does anybody know why, why would evolutionary, would it make sense to have the female above the male? Yeah. So the pollen from the same plant doesn't fall directly on the female flower. Perfect. Absolutely. So if you had the male on top of it, Pollen, it would self pollinate. You don't want to self pollinate. Your pollen, there's a wind pollinated plant. You want your pollen to go to the side to the next plant, so forth. So, makes sense. And here I am paddling on Aurora Lake, and it's just end to end aquatic plants. It's a botanist's dream come true. If you love aquatic plants, go to Aurora Lake and hang out. Great in the, in the fall uh, during rice time because it's loaded with birds. I don't do ricing, I just go to rice lakes to watch birds. Um, I had one time uh, 14 Sora rails, 14 different Sora rails on, a, on Aurora Lake. I hardly ever see one Sora rail from anywhere. They were everywhere eating the rice. If you don't know what a Sora rail is, there it is on the right. Black terns nest there with neck ducks. Frank Lake, just to the north of Aurora, see the, the uh, difference in the topography around Frank Lake. 70% sand, Aurora's total muck, 
the technical term up north for all that muck is loon shit. Are you familiar with that, that term? See how that come up here? I'm just curious. Loan shit. Loan shit. <laughs> um, so Frank Lake's just totally different. It's, whoops. Um, but there's my daughter paddling out with me. It's a sandy bottom. Uh, just a classic northern, what you think of as an archetypal, a northern lake surrounded by decent sized pines, sandy bottom, clear as a bill, just lovely little island. We stop off in the middle and had, a, had lunch together. Just a, just a lovely lake. Paraloons, of course, you have to have that. Last lake I'll show you is, is Tatagatik in uh, Bayfield County. This was the largest lake I found in the whole state that was wild, 538 acres. And it happens to also be the largest wild rice lake in the state. Has anybody ever been on Tatagatik Lake? Just out of curiosity. It's gorgeous. This is us in the fall, two falls ago, late September after the rice harvest. You don't want to go during the rice, knock the rice off. Um, just glorious colors. The picture doesn't do justice to it. Put in right there. And it's just, it's great. And it's just loaded with waterfowl, of course, because of all that rice. Loaded with uh, semi-aquatic mammals, muskrats and otters and beavers and minks. Just a great sight. So in the book, I part of the reason for writing the book is, is finding out that there were so few left and so small, we could do better. And I wanted people, I, I wrote about it in the back of the book, I wrote about the Wild Lakes Program. Does anybody here remember the Wild Lakes Program we had in the late 90s into about 2006? Anybody remember that? Where we had uh, an attempt to uh, buy as one of the uh, means of protecting uh, northern lakes. We, we attempted to buy uh, some of these lake shores from people that were willing sellers. And it, a number of lakes did get purchased off a pricey uh, thing to do. And here's one Cantook Lake over in uh, Bayfield County, uh, the Trust for Public Land and the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, all worked together to purchase Cantwick Lake and Steelhead Lake down there and another little lake whose name I'm spacing out just to the northwest of it. Uh, and you can see on the top of the map that there's four little dots there. So there were houses there, they were all torn down. Anyway, we had this program until 2006 or eight or so, did purchase some properties. And then because of political reasons that all died. And one of the things I'm, I'm hopeful for, uh, and maybe foolishly hopeful, is that we will resurrect that. I found a lot of lakes, a decent number anyway, of lakes that had one owner of, them, of either the entire lake or maybe they had a 40 or maybe they just had a, a single lot on the lake. It would be relatively inexpensive if for the ones with just a single lot or a 40 to purchase that. And there's all, the rest of it's already publicly owned. And then we could increase our number of wild lakes by one. And hopefully more so. So we have all this, this big uh, surplus, supposedly, in the state. I vote for we use it to buy more wild lakes. I don't know if anybody else thinks that's a great idea. I think I might be the only one, but that would be my vote for our surplus. Don't, don't send me back, you know, 30 bucks. I don't want 30 bucks. Buy a lake. Anyway, the book is illustrated by a, a young woman named Becca Jabs from Manitowoc. She did these gorgeous uh, color illustrations. I was just thrilled with it kind of work she did. Um, and that was part of the reason, again, for writing the book was just so people, as they're paddling along, so many people are only interested in getting from point A to point B. I speak every year at Canoe Copia, 20,000 people there, and 95% of the talks are all about, I did you know, some incredible trip. And almost nobody talks about birds and plants. You know, what is it that you're seeing along the way? And uh, anyway, I'm hoping that via her illustrations that people paddling some of these wild lakes will slow down and say, oh yeah, that's a uh, blue vervain and that's buried and so forth. That's lovely. So lastly, uh, the people that have given me grief for, for telling everyone where these secret lakes are, I always respond by saying that's a legitimate point. We do have a tendency to love places to death, but I love to use this quote, no one ever washed a rental car. I'm always curious if anybody in the audience here has ever washed a rental car. There's always someone who raises This is great. Nobody's raising their hand. Because I always have to ask them, so what well, did you wash it? Because it was a moral, ethical thing that you were feeling, you felt 
No, it was because they mudded the hell out of everything and they wanted to get the money back. So no one ever washed an oil car. So my whole thing is, is when we get into these wild lakes, yes, we can love them to death, but we can also fall in love with them and we can have an ownership, not in a title sense, of course, but in a commitment to a place in this kind of heartfelt desire to be a place. You, I hope we all recall six plus years ago, um, our, our government at that time, I'm not trying to be political, just stating a fact, said sell 10,000 acres of, of DNR land. Do you all remember that? We were just directed to sell 10,000 acres because we had too much public land, supposedly. The point being that this is going to happen more and more. Uh, we're going to have more people. We're going to have a lot more people trying to move into the North Country as we have more and more climate change coming upon us. <coughs> and, we constant, and there is constant efforts to open up the public lands to development. And the only way that development will stop along some of these wild lakes anyway is if someone's been there who can then raise their hand at, at a meeting and say, you can't sell that wild lake off. You can't develop it and do 100 foot lots on that thing. It's got this. And that's way more important. So anyway, that's I'm talking about a marriage to a place I want people to start marrying these lakes and protecting them. So I have a quote by Edward Abbey to finish it off which is blocked off, but uh, we'll read, read what we can. Mm -hmm. Wilderness is not a luxury, but blah, 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 to our lives as water and good, as important, I suspect that says, to our lives as water and good bread. A civilization which destroys what little remains of the wild, the spare, the original, is cutting itself off from its origins and betraying the principles of civilization itself. Good old Ed Abbey for the last say. That's what the book looks like. So I'm all done. Thank you so much for sitting here. John has books for sale in the back. He'll come sign them. They're $20. I know I'm inspired to buy the book and go to some of these places. And load up the canoe, load up the kayak, load up some food and, and go. Um, any questions for John? Any thoughts? Yeah, Eric. What's next, John? <laughs> uh, what book are you working on at this point? Good question. Uh, a, a huge national bestseller of poetry. <laughs> it takes all at least 100 copies, if not more. <laughs> Mostly the relatives. Uh, and and uh, titled? Uh, the book's based on Wendell Berry poems. So, uh, mm -hmm. What I've done is, Wendell Berry has this great book called This Day. Has anyone ever seen that book? You yeah. have? It's called Sabbath Poems and Wendell Berry on Sundays for 40, 50 years. We go out rather than going to church and walk his, his farm and write a poem. And these are the best Sabbath poems of his over 40 or 50 years. So what I, I love is poetry. And so what I would do, what I'm doing for this book and have done is pretty much done. Uh, needs to publish it desperately. But... I may just self-publish, but anyhow, um, I would get up at 5.30 in the morning and say, oh God, what should I write? And so I decided that I would simply randomly open up this day to any poem, and whatever poem I read of the various, I would find at least one line in there that would trigger me to be a catalyst for me to write a poem from. So that's what I got. I got about 60 poems, all started off with a line or two from Wendell Berry. So that's the next one, but I don't know beyond that. My wife's keeping me busy doing other stuff. Yes. I know you had addressed peace and quiet in these wild places, but you, did you talk anything about light pollution? I did not. That's a great point, because most of these places are dark, definitely dark places that you can see all you know, the great beauty of the, of the night sky. Great point, and I did not. Next edition, I'll Try to put something. There's an explanation. Jim Marshall was yeah. kind enough to bring us snacks, and she's got an announcement uh, to make. Uh, and while she's coming up and doing that, Eric, what else? Um, John, one of the problems that we have in setting aside places like lakes is they're influenced by so many features that are outside, you know, the physical boundaries of the lake, within the watershed of the lake. 
And especially as we get to climate change and we think about how do we best protect these things in an era where it's not just an onslaught from humans and development of those, but also from the environment that we have drastically and radically changed. How do we save these wild places in a world that is changing under our very feet? Very depressing question. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd have the answer and <laughs> encourage me. It's a very easy. I'm giving a talk tomorrow night on climate change in Tomahawk, if you'd like to come, where I won't have any answers whatsoever. <laughs> but I have all kinds of charts basically saying, oh no, I don't know. What are we going to do? I mean, we can mitigate to some extent in forest lands, we can plant southern species, we can bring oaks up to the north country, white oaks and burr oaks and hickories and so forth. It'd be a hell of a lot easier if we just stop climate change right now, a lot less expensive and so forth. But that doesn't seem to be the process. We're doing a lot of great things. Uh, part of the talk I'm giving tomorrow night is about all the good that's going on. There's an amazing amount of good compared to 20 or 30 years ago, from wind turbines to electric cars to you know, the, the most recent bill, what's the name of the bill? I lost it. Reduction Act. The Reduction yeah. Act. It's got all kinds of fabulous stuff in it. Yeah. Well, it'd be fast enough. For, you know, we're going to warm up our waters. We're going to lose brook trout. We're going to take, we're going to lose a lot of walleye fishery. We're going to lose ice fishing. It's going to be slushy. We have a lot of losses. And I talk to people about the North Country, you know, and, you know if you want to move to uh, Iowa, move. Damn it, but don't, let's not change it in Iowa, because you know, uh, that's where we're hit, of course. Um, if you value loons, which is the iconic species, and, you know, there's a lot of data already, and we're losing loons. So what, what, what to do about it besides all the, the kinds of governmental things, <laughs> individual things we ought to be doing? We all know what fundamentally what those things are. We just need to do them and have the, the moral fortitude to demand them and make it happen. It's a weaselly answer, I apologize. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, make an additional comment regarding the need to protect these lakes and the environment around it intact is that it's more than a responsibility for the state of Wisconsin. When you look over the geography of the United States, and look at what already has been developed. Look at where there are a lot of lakes to start with. That's only a small part of the country. And then look at the development pressures. I was thinking about this last summer when you get to the, uh, the major weekends like the 4th of July and so on. And there are places that in Northern Wisconsin, you can go up there and it is still wild and still quiet. And you don't have the the pressure that uh, exists in most of the other states. And, and so if you look at it from the perspective of our whole country, this is one of our special obligations for the whole United States. If we're not going to save them in Wisconsin or maybe uh, chase the parts of Minnesota and uh, Michigan, it's not going to happen anywhere. Absolutely correct. Globally important sites, yeah, not just for our country. Globally. All right, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say, please come over and enjoy some treats before you leave. And there is hot apple cider um, as well. And I'm going to leave uh, the clipboard for anyone who would like to sign up. Um, we have people that have signed up except for uh, May, but we could always use uh, more than one person for presentations so that we don't have to feel we have to bring so much. So I'll leave it right on the table. So please sign it up if you can. And then briefly, John Munson has an announcement. Okay, read your newsletter next uh, month. Uh, I volunteered to help uh, put together a Grand Canyon rafting trip in 2024. That will come up faster than you think. If you ever want to wrap that, uh, let me know if I can get you on a list. Uh, newsletter will tell you how to do that. 
Uh, I also take people to South Africa. My outfitter has agreed that for every person in Audubon who goes on one of those trips, they'll make a donation to the chapter. So if you're interested in South Africa, uh, seeing the big game animals and birds of Kruger National Park, read your newsletter next month. Done. <laughs> Okay, help yourself to some hot cider and cookies. Come Thank buy you. a book. Thanks everyone online. Thank Have a good evening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs>